Hi, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Lily Love, an ENT with Christus St. Vincent Ear, Nose, and Throat Specialists. I'm here today with my colleagues, Dr. Jared Seibert, Dr. David Gallegos, and Dr. Nijoni Denapa. Each of us has a topic to share with you to give you insight into what ear, nose, and throat physicians do, and an understanding of a few of the conditions that we treat. Dr. Seibert will be speaking to you about sinusitis, Dr. Gallegos will be talking to you about thyroid nodules, and Dr. Denapa will be covering pediatric tonsillectomy, and I will be sharing an overview of the diagnosis and treatment of different types of nasal obstruction. ENT, also known as otolaryngology, is a diverse and exciting field of medicine and surgery, and my colleagues and I are passionate about it. We find it incredibly rewarding to help the adults and children we care for find long-term relief and healing that allows them to lead healthier lives. We hope you enjoy the presentation and find this information valuable. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Jared Seibert. I'm a board certified otolaryngic surgeon, ENT surgeon, head and neck surgeon. We go by many names. I'm also a fellow at the American Academy of Otolaryngic Allergy, and I'm here to talk to you today about sinusitis. By way of introduction, I hail from the great city of Chicago originally. That's where I did my medical school training. After medical school training, I went out to Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I was there for five years doing my otolaryngology residency training. Yes, you can see the rainbow here on the slide. We did pretty much have a rainbow every single day when I drove to work. I left work at night, so didn't get to appreciate them at night. After five years in Honolulu, we were transferred out to Seoul, South Korea, where we spent a lovely two years. This time of year always reminds me of Seoul with the cherry blossoms in bloom. And I highly recommend a visit out there if you've never been to Southeast Asia. After Seoul, we were transferred to Savannah, Georgia, where I spent the final two years of my military career. And then a few years ago, we moved out here to Santa Fe and we've loved every minute of it. So back to our topic at hand, the sinuses and the diseases that affect them. I just wanna do a quick anatomy tour of the sinuses. It's important to understand this before we talk about the sinuses. You can see here in this picture, on top, the upper sinuses are the frontal sinuses. They're the light blue. They're in front of our brain and above our eyes, and they drain down into our nose. Behind and below them in the green, the little speckled small sinuses, those are our ethmoid sinuses. Those are between our eyes and underneath our brain. Beneath those, you can see the large purple sinuses. The largest sinuses are our maxillary sinuses. They're underneath our eyes and above our teeth. And then finally, last but not least, the sphenoid sinuses, which are behind our eyes and underneath our brain, pictured here in a light orange color. So what do our sinuses do? Why do we have them? First of all, if our sinuses were filled with solid bone, they would add a considerable amount of weight to our skulls, adding anywhere from 20 to 30 pounds of extra weight. The other role of our sinuses are to heat and humidify and clean the air that we breathe in. Even on a hot day here in Santa Fe, we have to warm the ambient temperature of the air we breathe in up to our lung temperature. We also have to humidify it. I think we all are quite aware of the dryness of the air compared to the dryness of our nose and our lungs. And then cleaning our air. We're always breathing in dust particles, allergen particles, and the mucus that our sinuses create helps to clear those out as well as the bacteria and viruses that we breathe in. Last and probably most important, our sinuses are designed to help protect the vital structures of our face and skull, namely our eyes and brains. Back in the day when our ancestors were running around with clubs, hitting each other, living in caves, these structures of our sinuses would help protect our eyes and brains so that we could live another day to continue living in caves and hitting other people with our clubs. When good sinuses go bad, this is what we're here to talk about today. What happens to our sinuses? You can see here in this picture on the left side of the screen a normal, healthy appearing sinuses. You can see the frontal, ethmoid, and maxillary sinuses in this picture. What I'd like to draw your attention to is, especially in the frontal sinuses, you can see small little areas, as well as in the maxillary sinuses, where the sinuses drain. When sinus infections or inflammation occurs, these openings close off, and you can see just a little bit of inflammation on the right side of the screen can cause the backup of fluid, as well as predispose the sinuses to becoming infected. So what symptoms do people have when their sinuses are misbehaving? They can have purulent, or discolored nasal discharge out the front or the back of the nose into the throat. You can also have sinus congestion or nasal obstruction, and also sinus pressure, almost like a headache. 
At one point or other, we've probably all experienced one, if not all, of these symptoms. In a study in 2012, when they looked at all the reasons people went to the doctors, 12% of individuals at one point during that year went to the doctors for some sort of sinus disease or sinus infection complaint. As doctors, we look at some other symptoms that might potentially contribute or help define that you're having a sinus infection. You can have a decreased sense of smell or taste, something that's been on all of our minds, I'm sure, during this pandemic. Fever, headache, migraine-type symptoms, ear pain and pressure or fullness, bad breath, dental irritation or pain, cough, or even fatigue. Now, when we look at and define sinus infections, we're not looking at just one of these. So if you're only having trouble breathing through your nose and no other symptoms, it's probably not a sinus infection, more an anatomic issue. But if you're having two or more of these symptoms, it's potentially a sinus infection, and we'd be happy to see you and work that out for you. Now, what causes sinus infections? The most common cause of sinus infections are viruses. Viruses like coronavirus or other viruses that attack the nasal cavity. Now, with COVID, the sinus infection has been the least of people's worries, and rightly so. But there are many viruses that attack our nasal cavity, and this by far is the most common cause of sinus infections, more than 90%. Now, these viruses are not responsive to antibiotics, and therefore antibiotics are not warranted in the treatment of sinus infections. Typically, the symptoms resolve after seven to 10 days. The role of antibiotics is more important, as you can see here in the picture next to the viruses, with bacteria. Now, bacterial infections typically cause a more severe type of sinus infection with more discolored, severe nasal discharge, nasal congestion, facial pressure, fevers, and most of the time, antibiotics will help take care of sinus infections caused by bacteria. Now, the, a common course is that people first get an infection with a virus that causes inflammation of the nasal cavity and the sinus linings, and then a bacteria takes advantage of that already infected area and irritated area and causes what we call a bacterial superinfection. Other contributors that you may have that can contribute to getting sinus infections, one or if you have allergies, as you can see here in this picture, the allergens actually look very similar to the COVID virus, but they are quite different in size and how they affect our nasal cavity. In addition to allergens, your anatomy may contribute to your getting sinus infections, whether you have narrow sinus openings compared to your peers who don't get sinus infections. You may have anatomic things like polyps growing in your nose that can be blocking your sinuses. You can also have a septal deviation or something called a concobulosa or other anatomic contributors making you more at risk for getting sinus infections. Also, tobacco smoke or being around other irritants, whether it's solvents at work or lots of dust in the air, can all contribute to you getting sinus infections causing irritation in your nose and your nasal cavity. And lastly, some persons have genetic predispositions to getting sinus infections. There's also probably several genetic components that we're not aware of yet with the medical literature contributing to you getting sinus infections. But that being said, most genetic diseases that we're aware of that contribute to sinus infections, like cystic fibrosis or ciliary dyskinesia, are most likely showing up earlier in life. Now, how do we take care of sinus infections? You may go for the old-fashioned remedies of eating grandmother's chicken noodle soup or sticking your head over a steaming bowl of hot water and just getting symptomatic relief with that. If that doesn't cut it, you might go to the pharmacy and go to the over-the-counter sinus section and be overwhelmed by the sprays and the pills and the elixirs that can be used to treat sinus symptoms. And then if that doesn't work, you can go to the doctors and that's where we come in. You can see in this slide, there are four doctors, Dr. Lily Love, David Gallegos, Najoni Denepon, myself, Jared Seibert, who are all well-equipped, trained, and proficient in treating both the medical side of sinus disease as well as the surgical side of sinus disease. And in addition, Drs. Gallegos and myself are both fellows at the American Academy of Otolaryngic Allergy. So if allergy is a component on its own or contributing to your sinus disease, we are both fellows trained in the treatment as well as the diagnosis of allergy to include allergy shots or drops under the tongue, and we'd be happy to see you in our clinic and take care of you. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Lily Love. I'm from Santa Fe. I went to Wood Gormley and Santa Fe High, and I am now an ENT and facial plastic surgeon here in Santa Fe with Christus St. Vincent. Today I'm gonna to be talking about nasal obstruction. So what does that mean? Basically, it means I can't pass air through my nose. The way to test for this is if you get your finger and plug one nostril, breathe in and out, then plug the other nostril and breathe in and out, and then think to yourself, do they feel the same? Sometimes one side will whistle, sometimes you can really notice that you're passing air through one side more than the other. So this is a very quick way to figure out if you might have nasal obstruction. So a little bit about anatomy. Quick and simple, the biggest things are the septum, which is the little cartilage and bone divider between your nostrils, and the turbinates, which are these bags of blood vessels in the nose. These are just some basic things that we're gonna be referring to throughout this talk. So there's different kinds of blockage or obstruction. One is fixed, meaning it doesn't change. And the most common that a lot of people have heard of is a deviated septum. So if you have a deviated septum, it's basically that cartilage and bone between your nostrils is crooked. Often people are just born with it crooked, but sometimes it can be from a sports injury or an accident or a fall, and that'll push it crooked, but it stays there. So it doesn't matter how much you spray it or blow your nose, it's gonna stay crooked, it doesn't change. Another type of fixed or static obstruction is polyps. So nasal polyps people get from having chronic inflammation or allergies, and they're basically just inflammatory tissue. They're not precancerous, they have nothing to do with colon polyps, but they're just these blobs of kind of gelatinous inflammatory tissue, and they block your nose. I make an analogy that they're sort of like a peeled grape. And thirdly, another fixed obstruction is scar tissue or synechia. So if you've had nasal surgery in the past, or if you've used a lot of nasal sprays, or you blow your nose too much, sometimes you can get these bands of scar tissue that actually fuse the side of your nose to the septum and makes it a lot harder to breathe. Again, if you spray them, they're not gonna go away. Then there's fluctuating obstruction. Now this is different because it comes and goes. So the function of the nose is to actually warm and humidify and filter the air. So when you breathe that air in, by the time it gets to your lungs, it's not too harsh. It's not really cold or dry or full of particles. So the nose is the first line to prepare that air for our lungs. So there is a very thin lining of the nose called the mucosa, and it has a little bit of mucus on it. And the nasal cycle is basically this physiologic phenomenon where one side will kind of dilate and swell up and then it goes down, and then the other side will do that. And this happens throughout the day, and most of the time people don't even notice it, but sometimes people do. There's also gravity because there's a lot of blood vessels that cause the swelling and the dilation of the tissue. So if you lay on one side, you might get totally congested on that side and breathe better through the upper side, and then you flip over, and then suddenly that other side gets really blocked and congested, and the upper side clears up. Sometimes people have had that experience when they've had a cold because all those blood vessels are really dilated. A third type that fluctuates is rhinitis. We're all pretty familiar with this living here in northern New Mexico. Basically, there's a lot of allergies. That's one of the most common causes of rhinitis is something irritates your nose and you start producing mucus and the tissue swells up to try to get rid of the irritant. Of course, we can all think of juniper as a really common offender. And then you get mucus and runny nose and congestion. Also, there's rhinitis that's not allergic, but it's just from irritants. It's very dusty here, so on those windy days, the dust can certainly cause rhinitis. Also, when we have fires in the summer sometimes, all those smoke particles can irritate the nasal tissues. And so again, this is fluctuating because it swells up, but then it goes back down. And thirdly, the turbinates. At the beginning, during the anatomy part of this talk, we talked about turbinates, which are these bags of blood vessels that swell up and go down. And so they certainly get engorged and swollen. Sometimes if somebody has allergies, or if they're sick, or if they cry, these are all situations in which that tissue will really swell up, and sometimes you can barely breathe at all, but then it goes back down. And sprays and medications can sometimes help this. And then there's mixed obstruction. So this is a little bit fixed and a little bit fluctuating. So if someone breathes in really hard and you see the side of their nose kind of sink in and collapse, that is a lateral wall collapse. There's an internal and an external nasal valve, and these are narrow parts of your nose. So one way to check if you have valve collapse is if you pull your cheeks out right under your cheekbone on either side of your nose with your fingers and breathe in and out, if that feels better than it does at rest, you might have internal valve collapse. If you put little Q-tips in and kind of pull your nostrils out and that feels better than it does at rest, then you might have external valve collapse. So what do we do about this? 
Well, the first thing is things that you can just do on your own at home, like environmental control. You can get an air filter, and that filters out all of those irritants, the dust, the smoke, the allergens, and that can sometimes decrease the inflammation in the nose because you're not breathing in all those particles. We're all pretty familiar with filtration in the form of masks now, and there's different types of dust masks that filter out different kinds of particles, and that can really help protect the tissues in the nose as well. Also, avoidance. If you're really allergic to cats, stay away from cats. Also, you can check the pollen counts, and that'll tell you how bad the allergens are going to be. Certainly, again, juniper, we're always very aware of when juniper season is happening in Santa Fe because everybody's sneezing and congested. So you can check the pollen counts and then decide, you know, if it's really high and you're really allergic to that, maybe that's not the best day to spend the whole day outside. Or maybe you might take a medication or rinse your nose out if you're going to be outside for most of the day. Other things you can do, we talked about that nasal valve, are breathe strips or nasal cones. And these kind of literally hold the nose open. So the breathe strips do the same thing as when you pull your cheeks out to open up the internal valve. And these breathe strips, you just tape them on your nose and it kind of holds the nostrils open. Nasal cones do the same thing for the lower part of the nose. You just pop them in and it holds your nostrils open and that helps you breathe better. And finally, I tell people, stop blowing your nose so much, because even though it feels good initially, sometimes people blow their nose way too much, and every time you breathe, the sidewall of the nose is flapping against the septum, and initially it feels good, but that tissue gets irritated after a while from that repetitive trauma, so it can get a little bit swollen, and then it starts to produce more mucus to kind of protect that surface that's getting repeatedly hit against the septum. And so then you produce more mucus, then you want to blow more, and people get into this cycle, and a lot of times people will end up getting nosebleeds. So I tell people just be really gentle and try to minimize how much you blow your nose. It's probably not good if you're blowing your nose all day going through a box of Kleenex every day. So here's some other treatment categories, medical. So there's different categories of medications. Sometimes they're pills, sometimes they're sprays. So for example, allergy treatment. We're all familiar with Benadryl, Zyrtec, Allegra. These are pills that are antihistamines, and so they target the allergic response. There's also spray antihistamines as well, and this specifically targets allergies. There's also steroid sprays, and so these just target inflammation. They'll help with allergic rhinitis, but they also will treat just any cause of inflammation or rhinitis. So we're familiar with steroid pills, such as prednisone, and then there's a lot of steroid sprays like Flonase, Rhinocort, Nasonex, Nasacort. Those are all topical nasal steroid sprays. The good thing about the sprays is they don't really go in your bloodstream as much as the pills do, so they don't have as much of side effects. Decongestants. So this is another way to decrease the swelling and inflammation in your nose. Remember, we talked about how they're just bags of blood vessels that swell up and all that tissue gets inflamed. So when you take one of these decongestants, they actually will shrink those blood vessels to decrease the swelling and the blockage in your nose. So Sudafed is a pill that can do that, and then Afrin is a spray that will shrink down those blood vessels. And these are really good for pretty quick, immediate relief, but they're not good to take on the long term. So if you're really sick or you have a cold or it's just a bad day, it's fine to take these, but your nose can get addicted to Afrin, so we really don't want people to take these for a long time. It can also be associated with high blood pressure because it's constricting those blood vessels. And finally, saline irrigation. So when you're breathing in all those particles in your nose and it's, you know, causing it to be really inflamed, if you just wash out your nose, rinse out all those particles that are causing the inflammation, that can really help as well. And there's no side effects, it's just salt water. So you can use it as much as you want if you need to do it every day. So this is where we come in, surgical treatment. Sometimes, as we talked about with the fixed obstruction, it doesn't matter what pills you take or how much you spray it, it's not going to alleviate the blockage. So one of the most common surgeries we do is a septoplasty for the deviated septum. And as you can see, we just go in there, you straighten up the cartilage, and it gives you a lot more space to breathe on both sides of your nose. Also, turbinate reduction. So we talked about those bags of blood vessels. We need them because when they dilate, they warm and humidify the air. But sometimes we don't want them to dilate so much that we can't breathe. So what we do is we shrink them down. We cauterize some of those blood vessels so they still function, but they just don't swell up so much that they block the nasal passage. We usually reduce the turbinates at the same time as we straighten the septum to give people more room to breathe.
And then this is dealing with the nasal valve collapse. And this is a little more complicated. The other surgeries are pretty straightforward and simple and quick. But this adds a level of complexity because every procedure is slightly different. But if you put little cartilage grafts and kind of reinforce the sidewalls, it prevents them from collapsing down. And that can also, just patient dependent, you know, alleviate external, internal valve collapse or any other causes of obstruction. Certainly also you can release scar tissue on the inside of the nose as well. And then finally, sinus surgery. We talked about those polyps a long time ago. You can clearly see that if you just pluck out that polyp, you'll breathe better. But a lot of times people have chronic sinusitis and we need to open up the sinus drainage ports and just clean out those sinuses. And you can see that would really easily open up your nasal passages and help you breathe better. And this is a little bit more complex. So we went from simple to more complex. Sometimes people need all of these procedures done. Sometimes they need a combination of just a few of them. And finally, nasal appearance, because sometimes people wonder, you know, if I get my septum straightened, will it change my nose? Usually it does not change the appearance of your nose, but in some cases, like that first picture, you can tell that patient has a deviated septum because it's pushed off to the side, and if you put it back in the midline, his nostrils will be a little more symmetric. There's other surgeries that we do, such as repairing the nasal stenosis and nasal valve collapse, that will also change the appearance because we're putting some grafts in. So that one patient has external valve collapse, so her nostrils are almost well, completely closed. When you fix that, you can see she's going to breathe better, but it does change how her nose looks, usually for a little bit better, more aesthetic appearance. Similarly with the internal valve, it's not so narrow, so when you put the grafts in to open up the nose a little bit, it changes the appearance a little bit, but again, for the better, and he can breathe better. Things like a bump on the nose, that doesn't always change with these sorts of surgeries, but certainly if someone is interested in doing something cosmetic at the same time, we can always arrange for that as well, depending on the situation. So that's pretty much in a nutshell all about nasal obstruction. If you have any questions, make an appointment and come see us in the office. Hello, my name is David Gallegos, and I'm an ear, nose, and throat and head and neck surgeon at Christus Ear, Nose, and Throat. Today I'd like to talk about thyroid nodules, a very common situation that I see pretty much every day of the week. If you've been diagnosed with a thyroid nodule or there's concern, first thing I want you to do is take a big breath and we'll get through this talk together. I was born here in New Mexico and spent quite a bit of time in lots of places around the United States and had the good fortune to go to the University of Tennessee for undergraduate, back to UNM for medical school and very fortunate to attend the University of Iowa in Iowa City, one of the top ENT programs in the country. So a little bit of background on thyroid nodules. A palpable nodule, meaning a nodule you can feel with your hands, is present in just about 5% of women, about 1% of men. However, when we employ modern techniques of imaging, such as high resolution ultrasound, you can pick up almost up to 70% of thyroid nodules in a randomly selected population. Here's the good news though. The vast majority of those are benign. And I'll go through a little bit of the workup and how we figure out the next steps. The first thing, obviously, to do, because it'll be the first thing on your mind, is to rule out cancer. And we can generally, reliably do that with a few easy and safe techniques. There are a few people around the world with some notable risk factors. Unfortunately, people who have been exposed to radiation, and I'm not talking about the kind of radiation that we get here in New Mexico from the high altitude in the sun, but generally large amounts of radiation, such as in close contact with a nuclear disaster. For instance, people in Chernobyl area have extremely high rates of thyroid cancer, or people in Japan, unfortunately. However, the general population, unless you've had head and neck radiation, such as was used maybe during the 40s and 50s for benign conditions, prior to knowing of the long-term risk factors of radiation, generally the scenario for being a benign thyroid nodule is higher. The populations at risk, as we mentioned, also increase with age, actually. So as you can see here on my graft, there is an increase in a fairly linear fashion of the number of people affected by thyroid nodules with age. You can also see the anatomy of where exactly the thyroid sits. It's a small gland that essentially sits at the base of the neck. So a little bit more of an in-depth view of anatomy. 
The gland itself is about four to six centimeters from top to bottom typically, and less than two centimeters thick. It's a very important part of a system called the endocrine system as a whole. It generally has a role in metabolism, but also development. It is centered at the base of the neck between the largest vessels, the carotid artery, and the internal jugular veins. It's outside of the chest, but close to the entry of the neck into the chest. And sometimes, for surgical procedures, we actually have to scoop it out of the top part of the chest. The bottom line is all palpable anomalies of the thyroid, or things that you can feel with your fingers, should be evaluated with an ultrasound. It's safe and easy to do. Another point is that not all lumps are nodules. And so we employ a technique of ultrasound, which is the use of reflecting sound waves off of structures, where you can tell different structures from another, different densities from another. And it's safe. There's absolutely no radiation involved. As you can see here on the slide, it's done while you're awake, without any pain whatsoever. I know this is a complicated graphic, but this represents the kind of thing that we can determine simply from an ultrasound. We can determine the risk of something almost to within a percentage point simply by imaging it. Sometimes that's not enough, but it helps us to determine which nodules deserve a biopsy and which can be observed simply with imaging. The size and the features are evaluated, such as the presence of very dense material called calcifications, or the margins of the nodule, whether it's very spherical, round, or whether it has a concerning infiltrative appearance. Also, with any thyroid nodule, we should get some lab work. This is namely a thyroid stimulating hormone. It lets us know the function of the gland. By determining the function of the gland, we can tell whether this thyroid nodule, again, is going to be benign, but might benefit from removal. And how we determine this is with a separate kind of scan called a radionuclide scan. And again, this is safe and easy to do. Generally speaking, thyroid nodules under one centimeter, or approximately the size of the tip of your pinky, don't require further workup with biopsy but perhaps surveillance with ultrasound. I know this is a busy graphic as well. However, we as head and neck surgeons need to guide you through this process as safely and as smartly as possible. So we use a large amount of data that's been accrued over decades of research. And I would say the best resource is something called the American Thyroid Association. And they put out very detailed guidelines for not only practitioners of surgery and endocrinology, but also patient-related guides. This is just a graphic that I refer to, oh, several times a week, just to make sure that I do the very best thing for your interests. Essentially what we do is determine a stratification or a level of risk. And the first step, again, is thyroid ultrasound. If indeed we feel like the risk is high enough, then we prepare you for a biopsy. And this is again done just really under local anesthesia, meaning you're not asleep, you feel very little discomfort, and it's done sometimes even in our office or at a radiology suite where they do these types of things all day, every day. In this procedure, cells are removed with a syringe via a small needle poke. The problem is, is that this is not always definitive, but it is an incredibly important step. On this little slide here with all these purple cells, this is characteristic of just one of the many outcomes. This is called papillary thyroid cancer, which is one of the most common thyroid cancers. It is typically not life limiting or life ending, but we do have to address it. In this middle row, you can see the different stratifications of what we glean from a biopsy result. And it might seem very confusing, but this is just another level of risk stratification. Because the last thing we want to do is take out a gland that doesn't need to be taken out. There are always risks with surgery. And so each step of the way, we're making sure it is just the right thing for you.
when you come to see me or one of my partners who is highly trained in just this kind of surgery, we first devise a plan. We put together the history, the physical, the ultrasound findings, the biopsy findings, if performed, the lab values, and we discuss it all. We oftentimes will also consult with the endocrinologist, who is a specialist in all of the endocrine system. And we work very closely with many endocrinologists really all over New Mexico. So options would first include ultrasound, lab testing. And in the last decade, we've actually had an additional level of testing, which is molecular testing. Not all biopsy samples need to be sent for this. And I'll tell you just which ones those are, which ones will benefit, and how it guides your therapy. Sometimes, when we've done all of these very safe and easy techniques, sometimes we still have to take out at least half of the gland to start with. And that helps determine if we need to take out more or if you're just fine and we monitor lab work, we monitor ultrasound, but at least we have a firm answer. And again, that is always a discussion. And between me and my partners here at Christus, we've safely carried out hundreds of these over the last two years, fortunately. There are some excellent resources for patients that I would guide you to if indeed you feel you might have a thyroid nodule. The first step could be referring to the American Thyroid Association, discussion with your primary, or if you have an endocrinologist, or call and make an appointment. We're happy to guide you through the entire process. Thank you very much for your time. Hello, my name is Nijoni Denapa. I am a otolaryngologist here in Santa Fe. Otolaryngologist is also known as an ear, nose, and throat head and neck surgeon. It's a little bit of a mouthful. Today, I want to talk about tonsillectomy in pediatric patients or in children. I've got a few objectives. I'd like to talk about the background of tonsillectomy in pediatric patients. What is the anatomy of the tonsils? Where do they live and what do they do? Indications for tonsillectomy. So why would we take the tonsils out in a pediatric patient? What does surgery look like? And then how do you get a patient evaluated for tonsillectomy or what does that entail? So going to the background, tonsillectomy is the second most common surgical procedure in pediatric patients in the United States. Ambulatory means basically the patient goes in for surgery and then goes back home the same day. In some cases, depending on the reason why a child needs their tonsils taken out, they may stay overnight in the hospital. In the United States, the number of tonsillectomies has declined since the 1970s. So for example, in pediatric patients that are under the age of 15, in 1965, 970,000 tonsillectomies were performed in that year. In 2010, which was 10 years ago, 289,000 tonsillectomies were performed. So there is a big drop from that time difference there. And then I also want to make sure that I note that the indications or the reasons why a pediatric patient may have their tonsils taken out are not the same indications that an adult would have their tonsils taken out. And so this talk applies only to pediatric patients. So let's go over the anatomy of the tonsils. So in this picture, you can see the teeth up high and the teeth down on the bottom. You can see the tongue, which is not labeled. And then up top, you see the hard palate, which is up in the front of the mouth. And then the soft palate, which is a little bit further back. Attached to the soft palate is a little dangly thing in the back of the throat called the uvula. And then on either side of the uvula and behind the tongue is where the tonsils live. And you can see those are clearly marked there. Now I have another picture of the tonsils, but I also want to point out where the adenoids are because many times in pediatric patients, the adenoids are taken out with the tonsils. And so you can see on the right side of the screen that the adenoids sit in the very back part of the nose. Those are sometimes often taken out with the tonsils. What are the indications for tonsillectomy? So 
the reasons why one might take out the tonsils in a pediatric patient are for sleep disordered breathing or obstructive sleep apnea, which can be caused by very large tonsils. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Recurrent acute tonsillitis, so lots of infections of the tonsils. And again, we'll talk about that one in greater detail as well. Peritonsillar abscess is a very severe infection that is associated with tonsil infections that often requires drainage of an abscess, and that can be an indication for tonsillectomy. Tonsillitis or a tonsil infection can be associated with very high fevers, and so sometimes children will get a seizure associated with that high fever. If that were the case, we would definitely consider taking out the tonsils for that. Sometimes kids can have trouble swallowing because their tonsils are large, and so that would be an indication for taking the tonsils out. I would warn against presuming that all swallowing problems are associated with the tonsils. In a kiddo that is having trouble swallowing, I would like to make sure that any swallowing issues are completely evaluated so that way we don't just assume that the tonsils are the culprit. There can be lots of reason for swallowing trouble. Very uncommon in pediatric patients are a concern for malignancy or a concern for cancer in the tonsils. That's more common in adults, but we have very rarely occasionally seen it in kids, and so that would be an indication to take the tonsils out. And then finally, chronic tonsillitis, which is a very prolonged sore throat, often lasting months. Generally, I have my patients try and do some techniques that can get rid of that sore throat before we move forward with a tonsillectomy. I generally like to observe the patients for six months to a year to see if we can't get them over that sore throat before we move forward with taking out the tonsils. So sleep disordered breathing and obstructive sleep apnea are one of the most common reasons why we take out the tonsils in kids. So what is sleep disordered breathing? Well, the definition is written there for you. It's abnormal respiratory pattern during sleep that can include snoring, mouth breathing, and pauses in breathing. So you might see this in your child when they're sleeping, that they're, they're snoring loudly, they're holding their breath and kind of gasping for air. Maybe they're moving around a lot in bed and tossing and turning. Maybe they're, they're snoring and having trouble and then you find that they're getting up and moving from their bed to your bed. That can be an indication of sleep disordered breathing. Obstructive sleep apnea is basically sleep disordered breathing that's been diagnosed by polysomnogram. There are certain criteria that must be met for the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. So it's basically patients have symptoms of sleep disordered breathing, they're sent for a polysomnogram, and then they meet criteria for obstructive sleep apnea. So in a patient that has sleep disordered breathing or obstructive sleep apnea, you might see that during the day they're hyperactive, maybe they're seeming like they're tired all of the time, they're falling asleep very easily in the car, they can be inattentive or have poor school performance, sometimes they can have behavioral problems, maybe they're consistently hard to wake up in the morning, you know, to get ready for school, or maybe they're a mouth breather. They're constantly breathing through their mouth even when they're sitting at rest and not really, you know, having a lot of exertion and activity. What happens if a kiddo has obstructive sleep apnea and it's not treated? Well, sometimes in severe cases you might see a little bit of developmental delay you might see some failure to thrive, which means maybe your kiddo is not gaining weight appropriately, they're having a hard time breathing and swallowing at the same time. In severe cases, you might see that there's lung and heart complications. That is a lot of time seen over the long term. And then again, we talked about behavioral disorders. Recurrent acute tonsillitis is, I would say, the second most common reason why we take out the tonsils. And there's pretty stringent guidelines around what is recurrent acute tonsillitis. So it can be seven infections in one year. That's a lot of time being spent in the hospital. The second thing that it could be is five infections a year for two years in a row. So obviously you would be kind of watching your child if they didn't meet that seven infections a year, maybe they're having five and the second year is looking like they're still having a lot of infections. And then next is three infections a year for three years in a row. The other thing that, that we might think about taking the tonsils out if your kids are 
sick enough that they're missing more than two weeks of school. Generally, this recurrent acute tonsillitis, we are watching the patients for about a year or more, but that's not necessary depending there are complications associated with a severe infection. So surgery, what are the general expectations or what can we expect during surgery? We're taking out the tonsils which are in the throat and so you can have pretty severe throat pain for up to two weeks after surgery. I often tell people that their throat may feel sore for up to four weeks. There's lots of muscles in the back of the throat that are associated or they're involved with speaking, swallowing, breathing, and so there can, with that scar tissue he healing, there can be a little prolonged throat pain there. It can be normal to have some ear pain associated with taking the tonsils out. A lot of times people notice that they have stinky breath for about two weeks after surgery and that's because there are scabs on the back of the throat. The mouth is a dirty place and so those scabs collect bacteria and it becomes stinky. It doesn't mean that the tonsils are infected or the area where the surgery is, is infected. It just means that those scabs are collecting a little bacteria and that smell will go away once the scabs come off. The other thing that can happen right after surgery is post-operative nausea and vomiting. What are the risks of surgery? So what are the things that we worry about associated with surgery? And these risks of surgery are pretty rare. So some kiddos can have delayed feeding or get dehydration after surgery. That's most commonly because of pain. And so we try and make sure that our kiddos have good pain control after surgery so we can prevent the dehydration and things like that. Some kids will notice that their voice has changed. That may change temporarily, permanently, or it may go back to normal afterward. One of the biggest complications that I always make sure that I talk to patients and parents about is bleeding after surgery. And so bleeding occurs in about one to 3% of patients that have their tonsils out and we consider it an emergency. And so I think it's always important just to mention that because it is a risk of surgery. And then of course there are risks associated with going under anesthesia, which the anesthesiologist is better at talking about. So evaluation for tonsillectomy, what does that entail? Generally, I recommend that your child or the pediatric patient is initially evaluated by their pediatrician or primary care provider. What they can do is they can document a lot of the data associated with the infections. It's documentation of the number of infections that a child is having in a year. They can order studies to evaluate, do they need a sleep study? Do they need a swallow study? Are there other things that can be done to prevent these tonsil infections before coming to see us. If the pediatrician or the primary care physician feels that they do need their tonsils out or they may need further evaluation by a specialist such as myself, then we're happy to see them. Every patient is an individual, so we evaluate each patient independently. Their clinical scenario may be different, and while there are guidelines for taking out the tonsils, they're not necessarily hard and fast rules. And so we like to look at the entire clinical picture before we decide whether your child will need a tonsillectomy or not. Patients may require a little bit more of a workup after they come and see us. So, you know, maybe they don't have a sleep study yet. We might want to send them for a sleep study, or maybe we want to send them for a swallow study. Maybe we want to, or they're not meeting criteria, so we watch them for a little bit longer. So those are things that we might do when we see them. I did want to make a note that just because a child has big tonsils does not mean that the tonsils need to come out. If a child has big tonsils, they're sleeping very well, they're doing great in school, they're not snoring, you know, they're not having any behavioral issues, they're just a great normal kid. Let's leave those tonsils alone. They're not doing any harm. As an example, this is a picture of me and my daughter several years ago. Both of us still have our tonsils, so they're not always bad guys. If they're not doing any harm, we just leave them alone. I look forward to meeting you or your child in the future if it's indicated. I'm sure my colleagues would be happy to see you as well and evaluate the need for tonsillectomy if it's indicated.